Hello everyone, thanks for joining us for today's webinar, which is, as you can see on your screen, about the ACNC's Compliance Directorate and how we approach and address concerns about charities. Um, today I'm joined, well, firstly, my name is Matt Crichton, I always forget that step. Mm -hmm. My name is Matt Crichton, I work in the ACNC's education area, and today a special guest with me is Ms. Prue Monument, the Director of our Compliance Area. Hello Prue. Hi Matt, thanks, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, just before we get into the, the content today, I'll just run through a few admin things if everyone doesn't mind. Just throughout the webinar, um, where we'll be answering questions, text questions that is. So if you want to um, ask us anything, use the control panel on the right hand side of your screen, the go to webinar control panel that is, and um, just shoot through a question. And we have a couple of colleagues, Chris and Mino, who will be answering the questions for you throughout. So don't hesitate. There's, there's um, there's no sort of time restriction on this, you can just ask questions as, you, as they come up for you. Having said that though, we will leave a bit of time at the end, um, 10 or 15 minutes or so, to do a, a Q&A uh, session. So if you wanted to wait until the formal presentation's over before asking your question, that's fine too, we'll get to your questions later. Um, also, we will respond to the questions directly to the person who ask, asks the questions, unless we feel it's um, broad and will be useful for a lot of people, in which case we may um, respond to everyone, but of course we wouldn't. Um, we wouldn't uh, let the, the name of the person who asked the question out. It would just be the answer in the question. And just one more thing on the questions. If we do not get to any quest, any of you, your question today, never fear. We will um, get in touch with you via email, or we will um, uh, give you a call or whatever it may be to address your concern. And there will be a follow-up email that um, goes out after this webinar which, which may address some of the common questions if, if there are such that we didn't get to around today. Um, we will have a recording and a transcript of the webinar on the website um, within a few days so if for some reason you get called away, you can't watch to the end or anything like that, your internet drops out or whatever it may be, never fear you'll be able to come back to the website and view the webinar again later. And if you do have any difficulties with sound on your computer, try calling the, the number in the GoToWebinar control panel. That they, they have an option to uh, log in via phone. So if you're having trouble with your sound on your computer, that, that's one option to try and log in by phone. And finally, we do uh, value any suggestions you have for our, um, for our webinars and more broadly our education content. So if you have any suggestions on how we can improve our webinars in the future, please let us know and we'd really appreciate it if you took a few seconds to answer the, I think it's just a four question survey at the end of the webinar. And three, or uh, well, a couple of them are at least multiple choice, so it doesn't take very long. We'd really appreciate that. Okay, all the admin stuff out of the way, let's move on to the content of today's webinar. So we will look at the ACNC and concerns and how we address concerns about charities. First, we'll cover the role of the ACNC Compliance Directorate. We'll have a look at how the ACNC identifies concerns in the charity sector, our approach to addressing them. We'll talk a bit about the powers that we have as an agency, and then we'll get into um, some details of some recent activities and common issues faced in, in the charity sector, and um, a useful section to finish off, some tips for charities on uh, making sure you do um, everything that you're supposed to do and do everything right. And finally, a Q&A session. So if you do have any questions that pop up and you didn't get a chance to answer them as we go through, feel free to hold them until that Q&A section. Well, that's probably enough from me for the moment. I'm going to pass over to um, Prue, our Director of Compliance, who will start. And Prue, would you mind just giving us an overview of the role of the ACNC Compliance Directorate? Sure, sure. Um, look, the ACNC Compliance Directorate plays a really important role. I might be a little bit biased as the director of that area, but I'm sure I'm preaching to the converted when I say that the charity sector is incredibly rich and diverse and it contributes such a huge amount of value, not only to the Australian community, but global communities. 
in Australia, the charity sector holds assets worth uh, in excess of $260 billion. It employs over 1.2 million staff and engages almost 3 million volunteers. The charity sector is actually the second largest employer in Australia, I think, next to the retail industry. So, so it's it's huge, it's diverse, but, but the value is immense. So the compliance directorate plays an important role in protecting that. Our critical role is maintaining trust and confidence in the charity sector. We recognise at the ACNC, and I'm sure um, you're also aware, that it only takes bad behaviour from a small number of individuals within charities to severely damage the public's trust and confidence in the sector as a whole. The challenge for us in the Compliance Directorate is we have 54,000 charities to, to regulate. So we play a really important role in identifying the charities that may be at a higher risk of non-compliance and I'll go into a little bit more detail shortly on how we do that. We investigate and address non-compliance where we do identify concerns. Um, wherever possible we work with charities to get charities back on track. We also play a really important role in monitoring trends or issues and think about how we can address those issues. We feed a lot of information back to our education team to improve our outreach and guidance to the sector to help charities protect themselves from fraud or mismanagement. We also have communities of practice that we share our experiences with, such as state and territory based regulators, but we also um, chair a group of international regulators, um, a teleconference with international charity regulators in common law countries. And so we do share a lot of themes or issues or emerging trends with that group as well. So you did mention that there is great diversity in the sector and 54,000 charities would suggest as much. Um, of course, identifying the concerns would be quite the task for such a large and diverse sector. How Can you tell us about the, the approach that the ACNC takes for identifying concerns? Sure. Um, look, the community is incredibly helpful and we most of our concerns actually come from the community. Sometimes people that work within the charities themselves or just from a member of the public. Um, we also receive a number of referrals from other government agencies. So a number of other regulators work within the, the charity space, state and territory regulators, Department of Education, the ATO, social services, just to name a few. We receive referrals from other agencies where they may identify concerns that fall within the ACNC's jurisdiction. We also have... Um, strong working relationships with uh, law enforcement and intelligence partners. So AUSTRAC, which is Australia's financial intelligence unit, also the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission. So through their day-to-day -day work, if they identify a concern that is um, of interest to the ACNC, they will refer that through to us. In compliance, we tend to talk about reactive work and proactive work. So reactive work is when a concern is brought to um, the ACNC's attention, such as those examples I've just given. Something, something's happened or we suspect, suspect something's happened and a, a member of the community reports it to us or perhaps another government agency. But we also identify concerns in a proactive way um, and that's where we're looking for concerns that have not been brought to our attention yet or maybe even concerns that haven't actually happened yet. You know, if we can learn about the, the types of charities that are at higher risk of non-compliance, we can intervene early and support those charities to, to stay on track. Um, we do this proactive work by working smarter and starting to do a bit more data matching and data sharing with other government agencies to identify concerns. Government information holdings are vast and, and we need to use those to identify areas of risk. So for example, um, we look to work with the Australian Taxation Office to identify risks around private benefit. We can work with Austrac to identify suspicious financial transactions which then may lead us to engage with, with certain charities. Um, the ACNC also has uh, 
a great deal of its own information and intelligence that can help us identify areas of concern. This includes information that may have been provided through the registration process, but also through annual information statements. We also monitor the media and other open source materials for information. So there is a lot there and, and a lot of avenues leading back to the Compliance Directorate, which um, would be a lot to cover as well. There's just one thing before we move on, um, right here on the slide here, we've got a little spot that says um, the ACNC can only accept concerns in relation to charities registered with the ACNC for an alleged breach of the ACNC Act and or regulation may have occurred. Do you want to take a quick moment just to um, elaborate on that a little bit, Prue? Sure. So. Um People uh, in the community may often contact the ACNC and think that we can deal with broader issues in relation to charities. So fundraising, for example, um, if people are unhappy about fundraising tactics, I think is, is a common concern that, that is uh, sometimes reported. Or perhaps they're unhappy with um, uh, how it might be a sort of internal dispute within the charity, but there may be no sort of non-compliance or contravention. So unless it really relates to the ACNC Act or regulation, um, it's not within our jurisdiction to, to investigate the matter further. In those types of situations, we will endeavour to refer the concern to a relevant agency or authority or, or give the um, person contacting the ACNC another path to pursue. Right, right. So that's where those relationships are really strong and important. It's yes. not, it, doesn't, it doesn't stop with a lack of jurisdiction. There's those working relationships with other, other agencies. That's right. Um, all those avenues of, of intelligence leading back to the Compliance Directorate, um, can you just take us through some of the most uh, well, the breakup, I guess, of how much we receive from, from different areas. Yeah, sure. So in the 2015-16 calendar year, the ACNC received 930 concerns about charities. Approximately two-thirds of those come from members of the public. So whether those people um, work within charities or are beneficiaries, employees, or just a general member of the public, two-thirds come uh, from the community. The majority of the concerns that we receive, 66%, uh, are actually very minor in nature and are addressed by our advice services team. Uh, and I'm sure if any of you listening have uh, been in touch with our advice services team, they're an incredibly helpful bunch. So often we're able to resolve concerns through education, guidance, or it may be that we've referred the matter to another agency if it was outside of our jurisdiction. The, re the remaining 34% um, of the 930 came through to compliance for a more detailed assessment. Uh, the most common concerns that come to compliance clients relate to Governance Standard 5, which is the duties of the charity's responsible persons. And this tended to include concerns such as financial ma mismanagement, uh, failure to address harm to beneficiaries, or not acting in the charity's best interest. The other common concern we often receive is in relation to Governance Standard 1, which is the purpose and not-for-profit nature of the charity. And this tends to include concerns such as private benefit or failing to comply with charitable purposes. Um, entitlement to registration is something else that often comes up, and that would include things like sham charities, again, private benefit, or perhaps uh, having a disqualifying purpose, such as political advocacy. You mentioned just quickly there a couple of words that may not be familiar for, to all our audiences. Governance Standard 5 and, and then Governance Standard 1 being a couple of common things that the Compliance Directorate will have a look at. Can you um, just briefly um, explain uh, what the Governance Standards as a concept are? Sure. So the governance standards really relate to your obligations under the ACNC Act and the ACNC regulation. Um, and when we're making an assessment from a compliance perspective, these are the things that we will be looking at. And, and there's five governance standards um, in in total. And when you have when you register your charity, um, you should 
get a governance for good pack or you can get the governance for good pack off our website um, and it, it will talk about these governance standards in more detail but look in summary the five standards are the first governance standard relates to the purpose and not-for-profit nature of the charity so you have to have a charitable purpose and you have to be not-for-profit um, the second uh, governance standard relates to um, remaining accountable to your membership uh, the third one is compliance with Australian laws. The fourth governance standard is ensuring that your responsible you have um, your responsible persons are suitable, so they're they're not disqualified from acting as a responsible person. That disqualification may come if they've been involved in financial fraud previously, or they've been disqualified by ASIC. Um, governance standard five, and this is one that I really encourage everyone to familiarise themselves with because this is the duties of the responsible persons within the charity. And there's a number of elements that sit under governance standard five and it's about how the responsible persons are expected to act with care, due diligence and always acting in the best interests of the charity. Excellent, thank you. So, so they are just a, um, a set of minimum standards which um, charities are expected to be able to um, follow and it, it really is, as Prue mentioned, it's worth reiterating that it's um, something that all charities should, familiar, people in charities should familiarise themselves with and we do have a, a fairly comprehensive guide to all five on the website. Um, people got a pen handy, I'll, I'll copy a link into the email as well so you don't need to if you don't have one handy but the short link is acnc.gov.au forward slash governance standards and that will cover these five minimum operating operational standards to which charities must comply. And of course, they're the ones, as Prue mentioned, that um, often pop up in a, in a concern about a charity, so it's yeah. worth having a look at those. All right, thanks. Um, so the compliance approach, when, when com concerns do come through to the compliance directorate for, as you said, a, a bit of a deeper look or uh, mm. an assessment, um, <clears throat> What's the what's the basic um, stance of the compliance uh, director? What's the approach that you take to addressing these? Yeah, look, I our um, we always start from the premise that charities are, are doing the right thing or or trying very hard to do the right thing. We're incredibly conscious of the fact that the majority of of charities registered with the ACNC, um, I think about. 67% are small in size. So many of these organisations are going to be run by volunteers. Regulatory frameworks can be complex at the best of time. So whenever possible, we will work with charities to address non-compliance, provide education and guidance, and really try and work to get the charities back on track. However, I think it's really important to note that when the failures are so significant um, and the charity is not willing to work with the ACNC to rectify non-compliance, we will act swiftly and firmly. Okay, and we've got a, we've got a diagram here which may be a little bit difficult to see, but but again, no worries, we can get onto it. Oh, it'll be it'll come through in your follow-up email if you want us to have a detailed look, and it's also on the website, so we um, you can have a look at that later. But it, it, this basically is an outline of the the approach that the ACNC takes. Mm -hmm. um, can you just describe it for us, Prue? Yeah, sure. So this is what we call a regulatory pyramid, and uh, many. Uh, regulators will have something similar, but it's really outlining our approach and that it's consistent with the ACNC's principle of proportionality. So we're really aiming to employ the minimum level of intervention, compliance intervention required to return a charity to compliance. Um, so we're not a gotcha regulator, we're, we're not keen to, to go out with harsh punitive penalties if we can actually fix the situation with a bit of support, education and guidance. So the base of the pyramid, which is, is really a bulk of ACNC work, really represents self-regulation. So the ACNC does a lot through the provision of education and guidance or even our annual information state, statement reminder letters to help charities understand their obligations and remain compliant. 
Compli the compliance directorate really, really comes in at the next level of the pyramid where perhaps some additional intervention is required. So despite our best efforts to, to help charities self-comply, um, some need a bit of extra prompting and, and that may uh, involve some regulatory, some targeted regulatory advice um, to help get the charity back on track. And so as you move up the pyramid, the compliance action tends to become um, a little bit more firm and it may result in penalties, injunctions, warnings, um, with the most serious outcome uh, from an investigation resulting in revocation of charity status. At the pointy end of the, At the pyramid, pointy yeah, end where it gets sharp and hurts. <laughs> Okay, the, uh, we mentioned earlier that there were 54,000 or thereabouts, 54,000 registered mm. charities and quite a diverse sector. Um, of course, that, that, that's a lot of things to be um, keeping a lookout for. Um, can you give us an idea of the way in which the Compliance Director will take on such what, what seems to be such a massive task? Sure. And look, yes, with about 54,000 charities, we, we know most are, are doing the right thing or trying to do the right thing. But yes, we have to be able to um, develop, a, we've developed a risk-based regulatory strategy because we need to ensure that our compliance resources are really focused on the areas of greatest risk. And the areas of greatest risk to the, from the ACNC's perspective are those concerns that are going to present the greatest risk to trust and confidence in the sector. So there's going to be there's five factors that we always look at from um, a compliance perspective in that helps us prioritise our um, caseload. So the first thing we're going to look at is the nature of the concern itself. Um, this includes considering whether it involves fraud or criminal activity, whether there may be harm to beneficiaries. There's certain concerns that we as a compliance directorate prioritise above others and I'll go through those in a little bit more detail on the next slide. The other factor we look at is persistence. So we'll consider whether the concern relates to an isolated incident or conduct that has persisted over a longer period of time. Uh, we'll also look at whether or not the charity has a history of non-compliance. We will also think about harm to the sector as a whole. This includes considering whether public funds such as government grants and public donations have been involved. Um, other factors specific to the concern that we will consider um, is whether or not the, the matter is time bound, or whether it presents a new or emerging issue. And we also think about factors specific to the charity, um, whether the charity is closely controlled, the extent of oversight by any other regulators, and we will work with other regulators where possible. Um, and the size of the charity is also an important factor for us to think about in terms of how we'll engage with that organisation. So it really isn't a, a one-size-fits-all situation with compliance. It, it really depends on a number of factors. Okay, well, um, you, you mentioned that it's a, a, a risk-based uh, approach and mm -hmm. there are certain priorities. Can you take us through some of the, the, the more detailed um, aspects of that? Yeah, so as I mentioned, we are going to, we're going to prioritise some concerns over others. So um, the compliance directorate uh, wouldn't have the resourcing to go out and investigate every technical breach of the Act or the regulation. So we think about the harms, the harms that are really going to undermine trust and confidence. And the ones that we prioritise in the compliance directorate um, are fraud, and these are not in priority order, these are all our sort of priority one concerns. Fraud and financial abuse um, or financial mismanagement. So this includes things like money laundering, tax avoidance or private benefit um, and we know that, that uh, private benefit is something that particularly concerns the community. Just just quickly on that, sorry to interrupt, um, I think there might be a few people in um, listening in that, that might um, not quite have an idea of what private benefit means. Can, can you give us a, a brief outline of that? Sure, so private benefit well, it can look like different things, but it's really where you're gaining some kind of benefit from the charity. So um, the ones we tend to see in compliance would be a financial benefit for an individual, um, and that that financial benefit's not really in the best interests of the charity. It's actually right. in the best interests of the individual right. um, and and um, improving their own financial situation. So I'll give a few more examples okay. about that and, and how that may eventuate as we progress. 
Um, terrorism is, is another key yeah, focus and this includes the misuse of charity for a terrorist purpose or to foster extremism. So this could be charities that support ter terrorism financially or otherwise or perhaps charities that have connection to a listed terrorist organisation or a person or organisation of, of concern. Uh, harm to beneficiaries, we're uh, particularly concerned where we have information that suggests children or vulnerable adults may be at risk. Um, political activities is another uh, priority area for us and this is where charities may be placing themselves at risk of having a disqualifying purpose through their political advocacy or perhaps through um, illegal activities or activities that are contrary to public policy. And there's a great piece of guidance on the ACNC website about political advocacy and understanding what the sort of uh, acceptable boundaries of political advocacy are. And so any charities that, that do um, get involved in political advocacy, I encourage you to, to read that guidance. We certainly don't expect charities to um, not get involved in political debate and discussion, especially when it's relevant to their political purpose, but they do need to be mindful um, of the risks of being found to have a disqualifying purpose. Uh, the other thing that is, is really important to the ACNC is, is the lodgement and accuracy of our annual information statements. The integrity of the charity register is just critical for um, community confidence. Each year the number of people referring to the um, charity register is increasing and people need to have that confidence that the information on there is up to date and, and correct. So there are our compliance um, priorities and just to quickly mention that in relation to fraud and financial abuse and, and terrorism, we are actually completing at the moment a national risk assessment of Australia's not-for-profit sector and we're doing that piece of work in partnership with uh, AUSTRAC, Australia's Financial Intelligence Unit, the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission and the Australian Tax Office. And the purpose of that risk assessment is to specifically identify terrorism financing and money laundering risks in the sector. A public report will be released sometime in May. The assessment will not only help us identify perhaps charities that are at higher risk, but it's also going to help inform some um, more targeted guidance for the sector so that they can ensure they protect themselves from any of those risks as well. Yeah, it's a really important one. A lot of charities think that they have nothing to do with that whatsoever until until some of the details are uncovered and then they're, they're surprised at how... Um, I guess how insidious this sort of activity can be and yeah, we look forward to that, the result of that assessment in the report. And just, actually, just before we move on, that last dot point there, accuracy and transparency of the register and how Prue mentioned filling in or completing the um, annual information statement. It's funny, that's a really simple, easy one to cover for a charity. It's, it's not, um, it doesn't quite go to the, to the depths of, say, fraud or financial management or terrorism or anything like that, but it still can get charities in a little bit of strife. So it's one thing to, um, one easy thing that a charity can do is just to make sure that as part of their regular processes they get around to completing an annual information statement each year and um, making sure that their details are up to date on, on the website to, to just um, prevent any sort of uh, need for the ACNC's compliance directorate to get in touch with them over something as simple as that. And it's worth keeping a note. Um, so the approach is pretty clear. Can you give us a run through of um, the powers? We, we did briefly mention at the beginning about the um, uh, ACNC's jurisdiction. Can you can you describe to us the ACNC's powers and, and how we apply them? Yeah, sure. Look, broadly, the ACNC's compliance powers can sort of be grouped into three different types of powers. We we have information gathering powers, monitoring powers and enforcement powers. So um, starting with information gathering powers, uh, we can request documents and we can require a person to attend and, and give, give evidence to the ACNC. We can also uh, request information from a third party. So we don't just have to request information from the charity itself. We may request information from banks or other entities. Now, those information gathering powers are set out in Division 70 of the ACNC Act. Um, we also have to be mindful of uh, privacy legislation and, and other acts that may also apply. 
Um, if we do decide to use those formal information gathering powers, the charity will, or the entity we're requesting information from, will receive a formal notice outlining um, the exercise of those powers and what we request. In terms of our monitoring powers, um, in an investigation where we're looking at serious contraventions or non-compliance, we may need to gain access to premises, to the charity's premises, and we can do that either with the consent of the charity or we can request a formal monitoring warrant. Um, where we decide that access to the premises is necessary, we'll always seek to access the premises with the consent of the charity. We would only ever seek a formal monitoring warrant if um, the charity was uh, uncooperative or appeared unwilling to provide the information that the ACNC uh, required. Um, once we're actually on the premises of a charity, we can search the premises, we can take photographs, video record and make copies of, of any documents or pieces of information that we may, may need. Section 75-20 of the Act provides further detail on the monitor, monitoring powers of the ACNC. Our ACNC compliance powers, we, we have a number of, of different powers we can use and as I mentioned before, our first focus is always on helping charities meet their obligations through guidance, education or support. Where charities don't respond to this and still fail to meet their obligations, we, we will consider the formal use of powers. We can warn a charity that they're not meeting their obligation and explain what action we expect them to take. We can direct charities to do certain things or to make certain changes. We can make arrangements or we go into a sort of formal agreement of sort with the charity about what they need to do to meet their obligations and then we will monitor that over an agreed period of time. These are called an undertaking and it can be um, a voluntary undertaking or an enforceable undertaking and an enforceable undertaking can actually be enforced through the court. We can um, ask a court to make charities do or not do something and that's called an injunction. We can suspend or remove responsible persons such as a board or a committee member. Um, we can disqualify a responsible person. Uh, during that time the person's not allowed to be a responsible person for a ch charity and they'll also be listed on a disqualified persons register. In the most exceptional cases, we can revoke a charity's registration and that would affect their um, access to any tax concessions. And we also can apply uh, administrative penalties if a charity makes false or misleading statements or fails to lodge documents such as reports, notices, returns or even annual information statements on time, um, charities can be subject to penalties and I think we're going to just talk about penalties a little yeah, bit more. Yeah, we will more. go into some penalties. Just on that, just before we get, do get to penalties, do yeah. you find that, anecdotally I guess, do you find that um, the work of the Compliance Directorate does mirror this um, idea that charities are trying to do the right thing in that it's not so common that things will escalate to a revocation of a re registration status or, or hefty fines or anything like that. Do you, do you find that it's mostly on the the um, lower end of, of the intervention where charities um, sort of clean up their act or, or get things going straight again? Yeah, sure. Look, the majority of charities that the Compliance Directorate engages with or um, undertakes formal investigation of can continue their charitable work. So the outcome will be that we help get them back on track and they can continue. So it is the minority that would have their registration uh, revoked. I think the we do uh, enter into a number of undertakings with charities, particularly where perhaps you've had a really you've got a really good charity and yet they've been the victim of fraud or financial mismanagement, which was the con conduct of one individual within that charity. Right, right. And so then it's really about um, helping the charity understand how that was able to occur in the first place and putting in place good governance to ensure that it doesn't happen again in the future yeah, right. and getting them back on track. So in most instances, charities will be able to continue um, to operate. And that prevention in those cases is often um, 
in line with the, the medical <laughs> industry. Prevention is better than cure, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. But having said that, we do have um, access to some harsher um, pieces of intervention if, if required, and this and this slide um, demonstrates a little bit of that. Yeah. Look, I think penalties, as Matt said earlier, um, charities have ample opportunity to lodge their annual information statements on time and the ACNC has been around for a long time now and we have a really rigorous reminder regime in place where emails and letters go out to, to charities to um, encourage them to submit their AIS on time. So in light of all that, late last year we issued financial penalties for the first time to charities that were late in lodging their annual information statements and this really goes to that point of how important it is that the charity register is current and um, correct and that information is, is critical to have on the register and available for the public to view. So um, late last year we issued final warning letters to a, a number of large charities um, and luckily a number of them then lodged their AIS which were overdue but we did issue 40 um, penalty notices to large charities. So that $4,500 a penalty notice was issued to the charities for being late. Now these charities had received multiple reminders. Um, so while the ACNC issues the penalty notice, the tax office then pursues that right. Um, okay. debt. Right. Yeah, it's a pretty um, hefty amount of money to pay for something so simple, an administrative step that really could be easily put into a charity's operations and, and covered um, as part of all the other things. Absolutely and through the final warning process, so before we went ahead and issued penalties, we we issued final warnings and we learnt a lot um, and charities can do really simple things so that this is not overlooked. Um, some emails from the ACNC were going into charities' junk emails and so charities need to make sure that they set up their emails in such a way that um, where the, they'll accept emails from the ACNC or we found that um, the reminder letters weren't being escalated appropriately within the charity to more senior staff that could then action the AIS or charities, someone had left the charity and the communication was still going to that person. They didn't have processes in place to ensure that these sort of things didn't fall through the cracks. So really simple things that can avoid these types of penalties. Yeah, it's worth making the effort to put the simple steps in place so that you don't have to deal with something like a fine later on. Um, can you take us through some of the activities um, that, that has happened recently? We, we mentioned all the, the powers and, and the approach of the ACNC, but how has that played out in, in reality? Yeah, sure. Look, and this is a bit of a um, sneak peek, I suppose, because we will be launching our compliance report hopefully in the coming weeks. So some of this data is, is from that report. But really, um, between December 2014 and December 2016, we've revoked um, the registration of 28 charities. We've entered 12 undertakings, issued one warning, and 43 charities received regulatory advice. And I think that really demonstrates that in many cases, it's just about informing charities and helping them understand their obligations and putting improvements in place. Uh, we issued 40 penalty notices. We've just sent out our next round of final warning um, notices, so we will be issuing more penalties in the coming weeks. Um, 27 charities received self-assessment self guidance. So what that means is that we considered that the concerns in these cases were so minor that it really didn't warrant compliance um, investigating at this point in time and so we sent out um, some targeted guidance to the charity to undertake their own sort of self-assessment or and audit and put in place some um, improvements and that might have just been things as basic as uh, improving their record keeping minutes, etc. Um, and we issued 62 notices under section 70-5 of the Act, which is the formal requests for information. But look, the ACNC compliance report, which will go into a, quite a bit more detail and have some really use, useful um, case studies, de-identified case studies, should be coming out in the, the next few weeks. All right, and all those stats come from certain um, problems or issues in the sectors. Yeah. What are the common things that you have seen and um, 
that charities should should be aware of and, and look at their own processes to make sure that they don't fall into this basket too. Sure. Look, I think one of the, the ones that we see a lot of in the Compliance Directorate is conflicts of interest. Um, and I think conflicts of interest and private benefit are often tied in to, together. And what we see with conflicts of interest are related party transactions. And so charities need to be really careful about related party transactions. And what I mean by that is that we often see a situation where a charity um, engages a, a third party service provider, whether it's events management or it's to produce a particular product for the charity and they might engage a family member who has that business or it may actually be their own business oh. um, and yet they haven't conducted any sort of due diligence or um, there's no evidence of decision making to to demonstrate that that decision was in the best interests of the charity and that they're not demonstrating that conflicts whether actual or perceived conflicts of interest were appropriately managed and so we can see that Often charities do this because they think, well, I want to, um, you know, use the services of my my brother or sister. I trust them to do the right thing by me and the charity. But, you know, we have to be really careful with these decisions, and that proper research is conducted, due diligence is conducted to ensure that the in engaging that third party provider is in the best interests of the charity and advancing the charity's purposes. There may be other providers out there that can do it in a more cost effective right. way. So the charity has to be very careful. So it's not it's not a blanket rule that the ACNC will uh, crack down on anyone who uses a, a relatives or a business that they know of. There, there, there's no um, absolute prohibition on that. No. It's just about the processes by which the charity comes to the decision to use that organisation. And if there are proper processes followed with documented evidence of the, the decision making um, mm -hmm. uh, steps that led to that decision, then then it could be that the decision was fine. Yeah, it could be that the decision was in the best interest of the charity, but the conflicts have to be properly managed and people that um, have an interest need to be removed from the decision-making process mm. and it needs to be a, a transparent um, and well-considered uh, process. Which ties into the next stop point you've got there of poor record-keeping. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So um, it really is important. The basics... Um, uh, we do see poor record keeping and so then when we do go out to charities and ask them to show us how you came to this decision, where is this documented in your minutes, where was this discussed at the board level, charities are often unable to provide us that information. So it's just really critical that charities have, um, have good records to, to demonstrate their activities. Just going back to private benefit for a minute, I think the other types of private benefit that we we sometimes come across in our compliance loan uh, compliance case load is excessive salaries without explanation. So again, um, if if there are people within that charity, whether it's a CEO or a member of, of the board, someone within that charity that's receiving a salary, we need to see what type of um, due diligence was undertaken to determine that that salary was, was appropriate. Um, the other thing that we've seen is personal loans to staff. Um, again, um, the charity would need to be able to demonstrate why it's in the best interest to give a staff member a personal loan. Um, these types of things can really get charities into to some problematic areas. Uh, also, um, excessive allowances to cover out-of-pocket expenses, but not having any accounting of the actual out-of-pocket expenses incurred. So these things start to um, look at look like uh, private benefits are being obtained by the individuals that are benefiting from these arrangements. Um, and in some instances, it almost looks like out-of-pocket expenses are becoming quasi-salaries when the person may not be entitled to a salary. So charities need to be very mindful of this. Um, the other thing we sometimes see with private benefit to a lesser extent, but again for charities to remain mindful of, is that people often want to reward the good work of their volunteers, which uh, you know we understand.
the stand volunteers put in reward is requires charitable funds or charitable assets in any way um, the charity needs to think very carefully about that um, and needs to justify that any such expense is in the best interest of the charity um, fraud and criminal activities uh, we this often relates to financial mismanagement and, and charities not having adequate protections in place to protect their charitable funds. And working with vulnerable beneficiaries, working with children or vulnerable beneficiaries really requires robust governance practices including comprehensive child safety strategies. Working with children's checks in and of themselves is really not enough. Um, charities need to have policies and procedures in place to prevent, detect, report and manage child protection issues. So um, I really encourage any charity working with children or vulnerable beneficiaries to, to do their research. Yeah, that's an important one. I think it's one that charities um, often don't think about. You get the working with children check and that's it. We're mm -hmm. done. Off we go. But there, there's more to it. Um, mm -hmm. All right, how about some tips? We've gone through what um, things the Compliance Directorate at the ACNC has seen. So obviously there would be some lessons learned yes. from your perspective. What tips can you give charities? Um, protect your finances and your assets. We often hear charities tell us that they're not at risk of financial abuse because they know and trust all their staff and volunteers. Look, to be frank, this is really naive and charities need to have robust financial management practices in place. One person shouldn't be able to access all the funds. Use of credit cards needs to be carefully scrutinised and charities responsible persons must continue to ask whether certain expenses are necessary in advancing the charity's purposes. Um, the other point I want to make is that we we often engage with charities and they can give us every policy and written procedure that we could ask for, but they're just not using them. Right, right. Um, it's essential that policies are fit for purpose and they're actually being used by the charity. Uh, many charities may have conflict of interest registers or conflict of interest policies, but when we actually go out to ask how they've been used, they're just not being used. Um, and similarly, charities need to ensure that their governing documents, such as their constitution, is understood by members and that it's kept current and, and up to date, that it remains relevant to the organisation. Um, we talked about record keeping and how important that is to just demonstrate how decisions are being made um, and how finances are being spent. I think one of the other quite um, timely topics as well is, is about protecting the charity's greatest asset, which in most cases is the charity's reputation. It's always important for charities to consider whether the actions of the charity, while maybe the actions are technically lawful, do they align with the values of the charity and do they meet public expectations? Um, what will the public perception of these activities or actions be? Um, and this is particularly important when engaging third parties to work with your charity. You need to always consider uh, ensure that they're operating consistently with the values of your own charity. And I think a recent example of this is in relation to fundraising uh, organisations. Charities can't outsource responsibility. So if you are going to engage third party providers for, for whatever it may be, undertake careful due diligence and in, that includes ongoing monitoring and assurance checks. There's loss of public trust for your charity really is going to be quite devastating. So look, I think they're some of the key things that charities um, should be mindful of and they're the areas that we often um, find uh, common uh, problems. Excellent, thanks. I think that last one's a really good point because a lot of um, people understandably get caught up in the day-to-day -day, um, work of a charity which is which is very busy and, and many would agree, I'm sure listeners would agree that it's often um, an understaffed workforce that, that is doing lots of work and it's easy to, um, as you said, be a little bit naive about the importance of policies and, and make sure that you're following um, procedures and policies and, and thinking about public expectation and public um, perception of the decisions that, that your charity has made and, and the actions that your charity is taking, particularly with something like fundraising. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good point. Um, we have come to the end of the formal presentation, but of course we've got 
some time to um, answer some questions, and a few of them have come through. Just on the slide here, um, there are a list of important resources and, and guides and tips and whatnot on our website, um, which will help lots of charities sort of get their heads around much of what we've talked about today. That will be included in a follow-up email, so you don't need to rush for a pen and paper and start scribbling them down now. I will send that out to everyone. But um, it's important to, you often see a bunch of links and think, oh yeah, I'll look at that one day. We just want to reiterate that how much of the uh, problems charities face can be mitigated by simple, simple steps and, and making sure that the operations follow these simple steps and, and keeping the compliance director from the ACC away is, is pretty easy if you do so. <laughs> Let's get into a few questions. One that popped up, actually there was one about all the stats and I think Prue did cover that in one of the um, slides that we do have a report coming out fairly soon. Can you just give us, someone wanted to know if all these stats and all this information is available in, in a document or, mm. or something. Um, can you just um, outline that report coming out soon? Sure. So we will have a compliance report coming out in the next few weeks which will look at our PACNC's compliance activities over the last uh, two years. There are um, reports prior to that up on the website, so compliance reports, so there's one looking at um, the two year period prior to the end of December 2014. So today we've issued these compliance reports every two years. Um, from now on we will, will be um, releasing the reports annually. So there, there is some data on there but the next report's not far away. Excellent. And you can see there's a link there to that report that Prue mentioned, the fourth one down from the top there. And also there's a lot of data and statistics in our annual report, which is really um, easy to navigate and is available on the website. Um, predictably, I guess, private benefit is a mm. huge one. Mm. And there are a few questions that have popped through on private benefit. We'll start, well, there are a few that we might get to, but we'll start with one um, about um, you mentioned salaries and um, I think the, the phrase you used was excessively large without explanation or something <laughs> along those lines. Let, let's just, can you take a moment to clear up this um, difference between someone getting paid and getting a reasonable salary, which of course isn't um, doing any wrong, no. and, and I guess crossing that line. And where does that line lie? Because a few people have asked about um, uh, percentages of, of funds or is there, a, is there a limit on CEO salaries? How do you look at that? Yeah, look we don't have limits or percentages and again it um, reflects the, that we don't have a sort of one size fits all approach to this. So if we had any concerns um, about salary appearing particularly excessive, we would ask the charity to demonstrate how they came to that decision. So what kind of due diligence did the charity itself undertake? Maybe there were some uh, similar charities that they could have used as a point of comparison. Maybe it was in assessing um, the person's skills and experience for that role. So it actually, at the end of the day, may be quite justified right, right. Um, and their roles within roles and responsibilities within the charity may make it quite justified. So what we would be looking at, we, we would never go out and say, well, you know, organisations A, B and C pay this much, so we would expect you to be paying the same. We would just ask to see uh, what type of um, considerations went into uh, coming to that salary. Right. So similar to that, that um, point we made earlier about making the effort to, to go through the, the, the proper decision making processes and record them to make sure that any decision such as a CEO salary or, or staff salaries or out of pocket expenses follow a procedure and it's mm. clear and documented and, and anything can be justified. Yes, and look where, you know, I think the, the, the situations that we've seen in compliance where it's a private benefit are, are much more sort of blatant and concerning where one individual has decided alone that their salary will be $200,000 <laughs> as opposed to it being uh, more transparently considered perhaps at the board level, etc. Right. So, you know, it's, it's, if, if we can see that there's been some consideration undertaken and it's been an open, transparent process and that it's justified, we're not going to be concerned right. about it. It'd be pretty easy to give yourself a huge salary if you're the only one making the decision well, and there's no right. voting involved with other people. Imagine all jobs were like that. 
Um, we have another one, um, just about conflict of interest and um, declarations of current employment or, or service on another organisation's boards. Um, we did touch on conflict of interest briefly before. Um, should charities, what, well I guess firstly, what should charities um, look out for with conflict of interest and, and then um, what sort of detail should be on um, a record or on a, on a conflict of interest register or something like that? Mm, okay. Um, look, there is uh, some quite good information on our website about conflicts of interest, but also the Governance Institute has some really useful and practical uh, information around managing conflicts of interest. But charities should have a conflict of interest register, so if you are bringing new people on or your current employer's situation is, is changing, they should be putting any potential conflicts up, and that, that may be in relation to working with another organisation, it may be in relation to working with um, a different organisation outside of the charity sector, so a private organisation. It could be to do with relationship with board members, etc. So all of those things where um, there's a risk of there being an actual or a perceived conflict of interest. So I think it's important to remember that it can also just be a perceived conflict of interest. It, all of these things should be placed onto a register and they should be regularly reviewed at the board level um, and certainly you should have processes and policies in place so that people that um, may be at uh, risk of having a perceived or actual conflict of interest are removed from any decisions where that conflict would come into play. So for example, if I, um, if my partner had a business and the charity was looking to engage that business, I should be completely removed from any of that decision making process. Everything should be well documented and there should be thorough due diligence undertaken to ensure that that decision to engage uh, my partner's company is in the best interests of the charity. And that's a really important, uh, the, the point about perceived conflict of interest too is really important. So mm -hmm. in that last hypothetical that Prue gave, I guess in, in the case that if, if you promised and promised with your hand across your heart and everything that you wouldn't allow your emotions to influence your decision, and you didn't, mm. and you were honest, it doesn't matter if everyone thinks that the decision hasn't been made um, properly because of the connection that you have to the company that the charity might be using. So there, there's the perception of conflict of interest which is really important to cover. Mm -hmm. um, we did uh, have a question here about um, the removal, uh, suspension removal and disqualification of, of responsible persons. Um, have Has the ACNC um, so the ACNC's commissioner has the power to disqualify um, responsible persons. Um, based on my understanding, she hasn't exercised that power to date. We have had situations where ASIC, somebody is disqualified um, under ASIC's uh, regulations and so then that in turn automatically disqualifies them from being a responsible person uh, with, with the charity. So we have had some situations where a charity has applied for registration and we've identified that one of the responsible persons is, is disqualified and so we've said, well, you know, that person can't act as a responsible person for the charity. And similarly, we've had situations where a charity is operating and one of the responsible persons situation changes and they're disqualified by ASIC and so in turn um, they need to step aside and um, bring that to the ACNC's attention. Uh, just because they are disqualified it doesn't automatically mean that they can't continue to operate with the charity but they would need to put forward a case to the Commissioner and it would be considered by the ACNC as to whether or not it was appropriate for them to remain with the charity. Again, not a one-size-fits-all, I guess, with that one either. No. Um, just back to um, private benefit again, one other question that we, we didn't quite get around to. Um, you, you mentioned out-of-pocket expenses and, and whatnot, it, and it not being a one-size-fits-all situation, so all charities will have different activities which will incur different costs and, and different reasonable costs, of course. Mm. Um, how should a charity... Um, uh, record these and how, how should it uh, decide what is a reasonable cost and, and when 
people's out-of-pocket expenses are, are, as you said, becoming a supplementary salary when mm. they shouldn't be. Mm. Look, I think it really comes down to good record keeping. So out-of-pocket expenses should be out-of-pocket expenses. So there should be an expense that's been in, um, incurred and people, whether they're volunteers or employees, should have receipts for those. So then it becomes about record keeping of how those um, costs are considered and then how the person is subsequently reimbursed and, and the charity should have in place their own policies and procedures to determine what is an appropriate out-of-pocket expense, whether it's related to travel, whether it's for the use of their own private vehicle, etc. Where it becomes problematic is where there's no record keeping so people aren't producing receipts and um, just sort of lump sum payments are being agreed to volunteers or employees um, and uh, you know it, it's there, there's no system or process that really accompanies um, the checking to ensure that this does relate to out of office expenses. And just one final one, we've ticked over to one o'clock so we're about to finish, so just one final one, would you say that um, much of this does come down to um, maybe we could call it naivety, but also just, just um, simple poor practices which don't cover uh, some of these record keeping practices and whatnot, rather than deliberate attempts to say, filter money through from a charity or, or, or um, you know, make sure that they, they benefit privately. Would you say on the, on, across the board it's just general mismanagement and naivety? Um. It's hard to answer that question because I think that sometimes when you have weak systems and processes which which may just be poor financial management, you'll have people that want to knowingly exploit that. Right, right. So it's difficult. I mean, it's just important that you, you have really robust practices in place. And going back to this point where we often hear charities tell us, but we know our volunteers, we know our employees, we trust them, that's not sufficient. Um, you do need to protect the charity's finances and charity's interests. Look, I think we see I think we see a bit of both. I think that there's a small, very small number in the sector that set out to structure the entity in such a way as to gain a private advantage or a private benefit, but they're very small in, in number. Right. Um, and through our sort of risk-based approach we we hope to identify those. In most cases, it um, is just poor financial management or poor governance that makes the charity vulnerable to abuse. Which actually brings us probably to, I think, one of the first sentences you said today, Prue, which was about the um, one one uh, poor act or, or one scandal from one charity has the capacity to to really affect the entire sector. So keeping um, strong processes in place and, and good governance is really um, crucial, not only to a single entity, a single charity, but the whole um, charity sector as a whole. That's right. And so the ACN's job, ACNC's job really is to maintain trust and confidence in the sector, but you know, at the individual level, your role, the charity's role is to protect their reputation and, and these types of things will, will Will damage their reputation and um, you know risk losing a lot of funds and risk the viability of the charity into the future and we don't want that. Excellent. Well, we have tipped over past one o'clock now, so that will be it for today's webinar. As always, this was this has been recorded and will be published on our website within a few days. And a follow-up email will go through to everyone with these links and the and a link to the published presentation, so you have all the resources. I'm sorry if we didn't get around to one of your questions today. We did have quite a few attendees and quite a lot of questions coming through, but um, we do still have uh, Chris and Mino answering questions at the moment, so if you wanted to get through a couple of last minute ones um, on the text, we, we can, we can um, manage that. Otherwise, we can um, get in touch with you via email or, as Prue mentioned, our advice services team is really knowledgeable and there's no waiting time to call us and get on the phone. It's not like some other department. So you can just call up and get a tailored specific advice to your charity's um, issue. Also, it's a good idea to stay in touch with lots of um, announcements come through the Commissioner's column and our um, fortnightly email updates. We do have lots of web guidance, podcasts and um, webinars on the website, um, so it's worth checking out if there are any other topics that you want to catch up on. 
Our advice services team number is a 13 ACNC, which is 132262, and they're great. Call up, ask some questions about your charity specific circumstances and you'll, you'll be able to have your question answered there. And of course, we are big on social media, so follow us on all those channels. We'll skip past the questions thing, we've done that. <laughs> okay, thank you for joining us today, we really appreciate it. Our next webinar will be on February 21st. It's um, dedicated to helping out parents and um, citizens associations. Um, Is that today? No, it's 21st, sorry, 21st of March. Uh Okay. <laughs> Thanks, I'm glad you're here, um, otherwise people would have been scrambling to try and register for one that started an hour ago. Um, that's Helping Parents and Citizens Associations. So if you know anyone who's in a PNC, a parents and friends I think they're called sometimes, let them know that we've got a webinar specifically aimed at helping them out, helping them with their charity registration and what they need to do to maintain charity registration. And um, we look forward to speaking to um, lots of PNCs or people that help out PNCs then. If you have any feedback, send us an email at education at acnc.gov.au and at the end of this webinar, if you wouldn't mind taking a couple of minutes to fill in the survey, that would be greatly appreciated. Once again, thanks for attending today. Thank you, Prue. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. And we'll see you next time. Bye.